Alright, so from observing the absurd, ridiculous statements in poor explanation from Stephen Anderson regarding Hebrews 4, let's go through this chapter and see what it really says. You see, there's a long-standing rumor that Hebrews 4 teaches that Sabbath has been fulfilled in Christ and that He is the Sabbath. Even though that is ridiculous and completely irrelevant to this chapter, let's go through this chapter to prove by scripture and logical fact that it is not fulfilling or showing that Christ is the Sabbath. In chapter 3, God gave a brief history of Israel, showing why they could not enter into His rest because of their sin. Let's begin. Verse 1, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into His rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. As pointed out in chapter 3, the children of Israel fell short of entering into that rest. That's why they could not enter in because of unbelief. So Paul writes to make sure that we fear. He mentions a promise being left us of entering into his rest. If a promise is left to us, then obviously he's speaking of a future event. Us, read the verse, is present tense. A promise left to us is future tense. If it's already fulfilled now, then it's not a promise, is it? Simple grammatical logical sense. Lastly, he mentions coming short of it, which in other words is not crossing the finish line. So if we have eternal security and can never lose our salvation in this life, then obviously what Paul wrote is a lie. Plain and simple. Verse 2, For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. The gospel was preached to Israel in the Old Testament, as well as us now. It was not accepted because Israel rebelled against God. It had to be mixed with faith, the word mixed, something most fake Christians are very uncomfortable with, the word mixed. Scary word, right? Verse 3. For we which have believed do enter into his rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So we which believe do enter into rest. Do is a present tense word. So if we already enter into rest, his rest, then obviously this is a different kind of rest than what Paul was writing about in verse 1. Once again, verse 1, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Verse 1 speaks of a future rest. Verse 3 speaks of a present rest in this life. Both are in Christ. How do we know this is a different kind of rest in verse 3? Because the works were finished from the foundation of the world. What works is Paul talking about? As stated many times before, the context will reveal the truth and answer questions. Read the next verses. I dare you to. Verse 4. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. When did this happen? From creation? See Genesis 2, 1-3 and Exodus 20, 8-11. Simple scripture reading and logical sense prove it cannot be anything other than the seventh day Sabbath that he sanctified from creation. You would have to be stupid and willfully ignorant to think otherwise. Since it is referring to the Sabbath that he established during creation, why aren't these professing Christians keeping the Sabbath today? Verses 5-6 through six, And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth, what remaineth? That some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. In context, that's what he was talking about for the children of Israel, the seventh day Sabbath. He said, if, as in conditional, whether or not they believe and obey him. Once again, in context, some must still enter into this rest of Sabbath, and those from the Old Testament of that wicked generation could not enter into that rest of the seventh-day Sabbath because of unbelief. Some questions for people who believe he is referring to a future fulfillment of the Sabbath of eternal rest in Christ. 1. How could he be referring to Christ when nobody was looking forward to any cross or gospel of Jesus Christ and understanding and accepting it? 2. 
Also, how could he be referring to having eternal rest in Christ in this kingdom of his, when nobody, I mean nobody from the Old Testament, went to that kingdom anyways? They all went to Abraham's bosom. That's a different topic for a different time. Think about that for a while. 3. Since when has God ever referred to his kingdom of, or the eternal rest in Christ, to a seventh day? He never did. Verse 7. Again he limiteth a certain day, saying, In David, today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. He says the word again, as if people are too ignorant to get it at this point. <laughs> Seriously. He limited a certain day. He says certain, because we can know and have the certainty of the words of truth. Proverbs twenty two twenty one. Now, what voice is he talking about? The voice of the Holy Spirit. However, in the Bible times, he spoke audibly. So it's both. He's telling us not to harden our hearts toward the Sabbath, because some must still enter into that rest. Verses 5-6. through six. Read them again on your own time. So if this is the case, why aren't these fake Christians keeping the Sabbath today? Think about it. Verses 8 and 9. For if Jesus had given them rest, if, we'll get back to that in just a moment, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Wow! This is so clear of referring to the Sabbath that you would have to be really indoctrinated by man's commandments, opinions, and views of Scripture to believe otherwise. Stephen Anderson Jesus did not give them that spiritual rest in the Old Testament and did not fulfill the gospel in their time. Also, who's the them in the verse? Those from the Old Testament? And what's the other day he was talking about? The other day is referring to a future fulfillment of eternal rest. That's why he says in the next verse that there remains our rest to the people of God. There remains our rest. That's what the Sabbath is. It is our temporary, earthly, physical, literal rest until we go home to be with the Lord, the future eternal rest in Christ. Verse 10. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. This verse proves he's speaking of the Sabbath because he uses the word is. That's a present tense word. If we do enter into the Sabbath day rest, then we cease from our own works, as God did from his when he sanctified the Sabbath, he set the example. I've heard people say this verse is referring to ceasing from our own works in the flesh of sin, trying to earn our way to heaven, as Stephen Anderson so ridiculously and horrendously pointed out, in his pathetic explanation of Hebrews 4. That's stupid, because it's connecting God to the verse of having part in it as setting the example. Therefore, if you're going to claim that this verse is proving to cease from our own sinful works in the flesh, then you would have to conclude that that's why God ceased from His, because He was sinning too. Fundamental Baptists, especially Stephen Anderson, don't be stupid. Don't be dumb. Okay? That's not the case. Verse 11. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. When he says, therefore, basically it means this is what it's there for. Therefore, because we which have believed to enter into rest, verse 3a, and because the works were finished from the foundation of the world, verse 3, and because, for he spake in a certain place of a seventh day, verse 4, and because God did rest the seventh day from all his works, verse 4, and because there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God, verse 9, that is why we should labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Those are very good reasons. He shows us all the evidence, and we should, in result, keep the Sabbath. Let's go through the phrase, Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. This cannot be referring to primarily heaven, God's kingdom, the spiritual rest in Christ for eternity, because if that were the case, not only would that be nullifying and abolishing the seventh-day Sabbath. Also, number two, it would be contradicting the example from creation that Paul mentioned in connection to his point. Three, lastly, it would be taking away the day of rest, proving that God does not care about our physical health and well-being.
However, this can be spiritually referring to God's kingdom in regarding us not ceasing from God's commandments and keeping them and laboring in his word until we die. Keep that in mind. Verse 12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This is why verse 1 said, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Because the word of God is so powerful and is perfect at identifying fakers inside and out, we should fear. We must endure unto the end, proving once again why OSAS is false doctrine. Stephen Anderson, if you're watching this, take notes. Verse 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. If we try to fake our way to God's kingdom throne, it will be manifested there is nothing that is hid from God. Verses 14 through 15. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Christ is the reason why we can endure unto the end in keeping his commandments, Sabbath and context of chapter. He kept the moral laws perfectly and was without sin. He is presently our high priest to intercede between God and man to provide us with a grace and strength to endure unto the end. How do we know that? Read the last verse. Verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We cannot keep any of God's commandments in our flesh. So we must come boldly unto the throne of grace to obtain it. Conclusion. This chapter is not teaching the Sabbath does not apply, nor does it say anywhere in this chapter that Jesus is our Sabbath of rest. Steve Anderson, you have failed in your pathetic explanation of Hebrews chapter 4. And I don't care what anybody says, if somebody is wrong, I'm going to point it out, if necessary. Stephen Anderson, you are wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. And as far as you, Matt Powell, as your photo is shown here, don't ever tell me in the comments on my video that you recommend that I do something else other than YouTube because Steven Anderson is a good friend of yours. Here's the comment here. It's not my fault that you don't understand truth or are offended at it. I don't care what you say. There's nothing you can do about it. I will continue as a preacher of righteousness by God's grace and strength to proclaim the truth of the Sabbath. And I will expose the error and false claims if necessary. This is one of those times. I don't care, Matt Powell, what you say or what anybody else says. If somebody is wrong, they are wrong. Stephen Anderson is wrong. Fact. It doesn't matter whether you like it or not. He's wrong. So, brethren, the Sabbath still applies. Hebrews 4 upholds the Sabbath. So, with that being said, love the Lord Jesus Christ, fear God to keep His commandments, and read and believe the King James Bible.